The streets of Kiev throb with the sound of generators, keeping electricity flowing for businesses and homes, despite Putin's terror and missile strikes on Ukraine's critical infrastructure. Life is hard in Ukrainian cities as winter rolls on and the supply of power and heat are intermittent, but Ukrainians are undaunted and even less likely to succumb to Moscow's threats than they were in February. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce and our fantastic guests. It will help increase the popularity of our content in YouTube's algorithm. Peter Dickinson is Ukraine Alert Editor at the Eurasia Center of the Atlantic Council. He is also Chief Editor of Business Ukraine magazine and the publisher of Lvov Today magazine. Peter has been a permanent resident of Ukraine for nearly 20 years and has worked to develop awareness of Ukrainian current affairs and issues in English-speaking countries. In 1997, he served as the British Council's information manager in West Ukraine, where he worked to facilitate dialogue between Ukrainian NGOs and academic sectors and promote UK government outreach in the region. Since then, Peter has established himself as a journalist and media manager in Kyiv, helping to launch and manage a range of media products in Ukraine over the last 15 plus years. Peter, I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Happy to join you. Thanks for having me. And of course, you are, uh, it's worth pointing out, you are actually based in Kiev at the moment and uh, the electricity is on. So we will keep the interview going for as long as, as that lasts. Yes, I am. I'm in Kiev. Well, actually, I should point out that the generator is on. Uh, our electricity is not on this morning. Uh, it's sporadic. We're never sure when it will or won't be on for the last few months. But our generator is on. So, yes, we have a we have a secure connection. Good. So we should be should be fine for the next hour, at least. Yes. Um, well, I wanted to congratulate you, first of all, because I read that you have been awarded the Order of Merit from Zelensky for your services to journalism in Ukraine. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was a, a, a very big honour for me. And uh, it was very humbling and very, um, very exciting to go to the presidential administration and receive, a, receive an honour from the authorities here. Um, very unexpected. Um, but yeah, it was very welcome. I mean, especially at a time like this, when, uh, you know, there are there are there are many awards being given to sort of soldiers and people on the front line. But I think this award recognises the importance of information uh, in the war effort, doesn't it? And Ukraine has been remarkably capable uh, with people like you and, and, and hundreds of others in actually helping to dominate the information space uh, during the war. Well, I think that actually, yeah, this this the, the war, as in the the uh, post February twenty fourth invasion, Ukraine has done exceptionally well in the information space. Um, but it's also within the context of the longer war, the the the, the war, uh, the conflict that began with the invasion of um, Crimea and East Ukraine in 2014. And I think in that broader context, Ukraine didn't do so well. In fact, Russia did very, very well at first, especially in 2014, 2015. So it's been a kind of learning process for Ukraine to, to improve its communications. Uh, and also, I think, a learning process for the wider world to come to grips with the issues at hand and to to sort of filter out a lot of the Russian narratives or expose them as it were and sort of disregard them which initially gained a lot of traction throughout the international community and I think only in the last 10 months of war have, have, have fallen by the wayside so it was, it was a long process to get where we are today um, and if you look at the, the global picture Russian narratives uh, still have significant traction in the in the non-Western world, in the, in the, it's certainly in places like India, in places like Africa, uh, in non-aligned regions of the world. So it's it's not over yet. That's right. I mean, I was examining with a number of experts recently um, uh, the impact of Russia's uh, messages in the sort of global south and so on. And we've become inured to that, haven't we? We look at these and they seem quite absurd to us. Some of those are narratives about divided Ukraine, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we're all familiar with those, but they do seem to work outside of Europe, which is quite shocking. And indeed they're working with the American uh, right wing. Uh, and you hear these kind of narratives being repeated on Fox News and various places. It must be very disturbing uh, seeing the effectiveness of those lies. 
It is. Well, I, it's 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 incredibly frustrating um, to see them. Uh, I think I, I think uh, I've always felt, and, and I, I remain quite convinced that a lot of it is 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 not necessarily a, a real conviction in these lies amongst the audiences, but a a as a weaponization of these narratives because of other agendas, because of an anti-American agenda or an anti-globalist agenda or a um, anti-Western agenda, anti-colonial agenda, or you know, the, the different audiences have different hang-ups, but uh, I think they quite rarely are actually that engaged with Ukraine one way or the other. Uh, and to a degree, also that not that engaged in Russia either. Really, I think there's other global, you know, bigger, bigger issues that Ukraine has become a sort of uh, a victim, fallen victim of, or become a sort of uh, you know a, a fall guy for or proxy for. Um, you know, I think Americans, if you, if a lot of people in America, if you actually you know discuss with them the realities of the war, they'll say, yeah, of course Russia's wrong, of course Ukraine's been attacked, of course we should support them, but, but Biden but this, but that, but the other. And, that, and then you can translate it to other regions as well, where they also say, yes, yes, of course, but what about Western imperialism? What about Iraq? What about America, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of this, I think, plays into Russia's hands because Russia, Russia exploits this and they sort of just try to feed these flames and, and give them the ammunition they need to sort of say, yeah, well, this, this is good arguments why we don't want to support Ukraine or why we should question Ukraine. But it's not often very much about Ukraine. Um, as I say, I think I think that the especially since uh, February twenty fourth, the the scale of the Russian you know, Russian Russian uh, Russia's break break from nor international norms has been so severe that it's become very difficult to actually support them. Um, so I mean, they, they're just sort of looking for ways in which to say you know this yeah, but you know well, we shouldn't really well should we support Ukraine so much? But of course, there's very few people now prepared to stand up and say you know we're with Russia. We think Russia's what Russia's doing is correct. And the brutality and incompetence kind of underlie, uh, you know, it undermines their basic message, doesn't it? And if if somehow their military machine had been more effective, if corruption hadn't been so corrosive uh, on their ability to wage war, and indeed, I think their, uh, you know, their lack of of effective strategy and capability in the art of war, uh, you know, if they had been more effective, maybe their informational uh, warfare might have also been more effective. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, no, nobody asks the victor, do they? No one questions the victor. That's that's the rule historically. That's always been the way of of, of, of war. Um, that's as old as war itself, perhaps. And and yeah, I think if Russia had achieved its goals, if it had had a lightning strike and it taken down Ukraine, then a lot fewer questions would be asked about the the what Russia was doing, and it would be accepted all more or less as a, as a you know as a fair company, and and that would be the reality. Um, but. Of course, they didn't do that. And I mean, the, the, the performance of the Russian military has been one of the great shocks, I think, of the last year. Even, I think, before the war, there was an expectation, certainly in Ukraine and, and amongst some military people that I was you know, in, in contact with, people like Ben Hodges, who, who were quite confident that Ukraine would fight and would be able to perform much better than a lot of people seem to expect. Um, there was a confidence that Ukraine's military reforms had, had been more uh, comprehensive than a lot of people had understood at the time, um, that the army was ready to fight and that the, the fighting spirit was there. So Ukraine's performance was, was surprising, but perhaps not shocking, um, certainly not for those who followed the Ukrainian military closely. But I don't think people expected Russia to perform quite so badly. And the, you know, the, the fact, as you mentioned, the, the corruption that was corrosive, the lack of leadership, the morale issues, uh, the, the, the discipline issues within the Russian ranks, and the um, also the way that the Russian forces seems to be divided amongst all these different groups, the, the Wagner troops, the, the Kadyrov, the Chechens, the, uh, the, the conscripted uh, proxies from, from East Ukraine, from the Donetsk and Lugansk uh, People's Republics, uh, and the Russian mobilization troops and the contract troops. There's all these different units within the military that seem to be operating quite, um, not necessarily independently, but sort of uh, a lot of, in, in parallel rather than as, as, a unit, as, as one unit. And um, their, their performance has been, has been shockingly poor. I think that they've, they've really, uh, the Rus Russia's military reputation has been devastated by the last 10 months. And I don't know if, I don't know if they even if now if victory even if they were I, I don't see a victory on the horizon for them but even if they were to 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 transform the performance they wouldn't be able to turn that around overnight I mean that's going to be a problem for them for decades to come. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, they lost in Afghanistan, but when you look at the numbers of uh, equipment, troops lost, etc. 
you know, they actually had quite an effective fighting force in Afghanistan, despite losing in that theater of war. The losses in human terms were a fraction. The losses of equipment were a fraction of what they are now. Um, something has seriously degraded uh, in the Russian state, hasn't it? You know, they had some shiny equipment, which, like a Potemkin village, convinced the world that they'd modernized their military. Behind the scenes, they seem to have reverted to... A, and I've heard some Russian academics call this almost like a sort of feudal setup. And when you talk about the different divisions of the army, different commanders, it has almost like a medieval feel with, you know, a variety of private armies coming together and either gelling or in this case, not gelling particularly well. I mean, what's your take on on what's happened to the Russian state behind the scenes? Well, um, no, I, I, I like the I like the the, the Potomkin reference. I think that is it is a Potomkin city, it is a Potomkin village uh, uh, army. Uh, you know, I think they've had this they've had this they had this narrative for years that the Russian army is back and the Russian army has been rebuilt and it's become this incredible force, uh, and they're very good at putting on a show. You know, the, the one thing I think that works in Putin's Russia is propaganda. You know, everything else is pretty shambolic, but the propaganda operation is 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 world class. Uh, and we see this in the way that they're able to influence beyond their borders with Russian media operations in the West, in, in America, in Britain, wherever. You know, the operations that they run, um, although sometimes may seem crude, they are they can be quite effective. So I mean, the propaganda operation is is, is a very serious um, proposition, uh, and that's pretty much that's the only area where I could really say that uh, about Russia. I mean, you know, an army is is a reflection of its of the society that it represents. Uh, any army is, uh, and I think it's, you know, what it's saying about Russian society is not very, not very flattering. Uh, I think it's revealed a lot of the worst fears of people that they may have had about Russia about this, this feudalism that you mentioned again, the the, the, the level of corruption, the level of um, the readiness of people in in state positions, in government positions, to sell off to 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 basically sell off a lot of their equipment and then to lie about it and to create you know to you know, and the, these these things are um systematic you can't do this is not one or two people here or there you can't do that unless the whole institution is involved if people all along the chain of command are aware of what's happening or, or are benefiting from it so if they if they've gutted all this you know we say take for example the tank force it now appears that they've gutted a lot of their tanks. So they've, they've technically said they have this, you know, I don't know, what, 15,000 or 12,000 tanks. In fact, it seems that they probably have far, far less than that. A lot of the tanks they have have been, have been stripped and their electronics engines parts have been stripped off and sold. Now that must have involved thousands of people. In, you know, there's a huge number of people involved in that. And they all knew and they all went along with a lie and they were all quite comfortable with that. And now all of a sudden they have to answer for it. Um, that's a societal problem. I think that goes throughout the Russian society. You know, we hear stories about supplies being robbed. We hear stories about the food that they're getting is not reaching them. We hear stories even now on the front lines of people sending things to the Russian troops and then it arrives at a base and the guys at the base just rob it and it never gets to the front line. Even now when they're in this very, very serious war and they must be aware that they're losing that war, they're still doing it now. So, you know, I don't see that happening on the Ukrainian side. Now, Ukraine has a lot of problems with corruption, but I think that this war is such a, a do or die scenario for Ukrainians. They know that their statehood, their existence is on the line. It's kind of enough is enough for Ukrainians to kind of pull them together as a nation. And of course, there are incidences here and there and there are issues to be addressed. But broadly speaking, they've sort of just you know, their army has risen to the challenge and the nation has risen to the challenge. I don't see that happening in Russia. And I think what it's saying about the Russian the Russian um, society is uh, is very unflattering. It, it, it would raise questions about uh, about the, where that where the country's going looking ahead. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a massive reckoning in Russia as they, you know, when we come out of this, let's say, let's hope that in the next year this, this war ends and we're able to move into a new, a new era. I think that the Russians will have a massive reckoning if Putin survives. Mm. And of course, if he's replaced, potentially uh, the spectre is becoming, um, I think, more alarming that uh, it may be a, an ultra-nationalist who takes over. And uh, if he's not an ally of Putin, that reckoning could become quite uh, quite vicious because whereas it seems that, you know, they're, they're around sort of up to 20% of Russians who are quite vehemently opposed, not so much to the war, but to 
dying in the war uh, and, and and many hundreds of thousands have fled. There is a hardcore of people who are, you know, I would say ideologically against the war. And then you've got the sort of 65 percent or so um, who are are indifferent and will kind of go along with whatever, you know, the mainstream are talking about. I mean, there's no such thing as as, as proper social research, obviously, in a dictatorship. These are broad brush numbers that I see on on some of these sort of Russian oppositionist channels. But there is a hard core, it seems, of around sort of 15 to 20 percent who do not believe the war is being executed uh, brutally enough. There is a rising anger amongst these sort of hard uh, nationalist uh, Russians, um, so neo Russian neoconservatives, as it were, if they take over, because they are one of the only active groups politically, and we know from Russian history that when power is left lying in the street, when a vacuum forms, the only groups you know who take it over, it's not going to be necessarily a liberal intelligentsia who perhaps aren't um, aggressive enough or violent enough to do so. It's going to be whichever group is prepared to just go out and, and fight for that power. And at the moment, it seems to me the nationalist cause is the only one that uh, that has any capability of of uh, you know demonstrating that kind of aggression, the the, the bloodletting against the uh, the elite that have lost the war could be quite extreme, couldn't it? Yes, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't want to be in, in, that, in, in, in amongst those the, that the ranks of the elite uh, when they have to have to answer for this um, for the fiasco that they've experienced for the shambolic uh, um, conduct of the war. Um, that's going to be a very, very challenging time. I mean, I think now people are starting as Russia's, as the reality. I mean, you know, at first it seems preposterous, the idea that Russia could actually lose. Uh, I mean, people were very reluctant to talk about it at first. They talked about perhaps, you know, degrees of winning, how, how, how much Ukraine could survive or how could Ukraine could stall or what would, what would remain or, or how Russia could be somehow um, uh, contained in its, in, its, in its appetites. But I think, you know, since, since, the, the Kharkiv attack since the Kharkiv offensive in September and then the liberation of Kherson in November, there is now a sense like, hold on, maybe Ukraine can actually win this. Maybe Russia is actually going to lose and it will be uh, it will be a, a historic, you know, a historically unprecedented defeat. Um, you know, some to compare it to the, the Japan defeat of 19, 1905, but I would say it's, it would be worse than that. I think Japan was a significantly more respected uh, military force than Ukraine of 2022, certainly before the war, obviously, I, I mean, in terms of reputation, for you, for Russia to lose a war to Ukraine would be simply unthinkable for the Russian elite. Now, um, they would have a real trouble hanging on, I think. And yeah, what comes after them, what could come after them, uh, could be a very, a very dramatic swing even further to the right. Uh, uh, these are the only people now who are actually have any have any voice in Russia. That the liberal, the liberal Russian opposition is 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 silenced or exiled or muzzled, imprisoned. Um, they have really no outlets at all, apart from some you know individuals who are still uh, prominent on social media. But if you look at the the nationalist side, they are still quite loud. They have this you know the whole war has brought up this whole sort of ecosystem of of Telegram accounts in particular, where these people have you know huge followings of millions and, and are followed by. By the, by the West as well, and are seen as sort of barometers of the mood on the front lines. And also they don't, well, you know, while where the, the Russian media is, is very much still sugarcoating what's going on, it's still very, very driven by Kremlin censorship, um, pretty rigidly controlled. Their messaging remains pretty, uh, pretty rose tinted, but the, the, the nationalist side is not. They're on the contrary. They're giving a very sort of blood and guts and pretty grim account of a, a pretty critical account of what's happening. And the, and as they do that, you know, of course, they're gaining in credibility because Russian people are aware of the reality to, to a degree, and of course, they see that. They're seeing the deaths. They're seeing the, the casualties. They're seeing what's really going on um, in their own you know towns and cities, family groups, extended acquaintances, and so. These these nationalist forces, these extreme sort of ultra nationalist forces, are are gaining credibility, are gaining traction. You know, so they're sort of positioning themselves. And then you see what's going on with Wagner Group uh, and, the, and the Chechens and the way they're speaking out against the against the elite, against the establishment, against the military. Now you're still not seeing a lot of criticism of Putin directly. You know, he's still seen as sort of 
the untouchables are. He's still sort of above the fray. Um, it's not really the done thing to directly attack him because I think to attack Putin is to attack Russia. It's seen, I think he's still seen as the embodiment. Again, this, this, you know, there's no other way of looking at him other than the Tsar Emperor um, uh, comparison. But uh, beyond Putin, sort of next level, the Ministry of Defence, the top generals, these people were also untouchable. They're not anymore. That's open season on them. They're being actively criticised. And I think that there's, a, there's an enormous amount of satisfaction in Russian society about the criticism of that. People that cheer that, they enjoy that. Um, and that's hugely dangerous for where, you know, where Russia's going. Um, you know, if those guys are under attack, uh, that means that it's getting, it's destabilising. It's starting to come apart at the seams and, and where it's going to go. You know, it's far more likely that we're going to see these extreme national figures in power uh, or, or, or dictating to the authorities than any sort of any sort of I mean, there's any sort of swing to this liberal, this fringe, this liberal fringe, which really has been decimated. And of course, many amongst the elite are, uh, even if they're not in awe of Putin, they're fully aware that there are a huge number of of uh, uh, of the economic uh, and uh, and political elite falling out of windows falling downstairs i mean there's another one just this weekend um yeah. and it's not quite clear why this is happening i don't know if you have any insight into uh... well uh, one of the things about putinism from going back to the very beginning is you know putin is is often you know there's often people draw parallels with with stalin and stalinism um, but Stalin killed on an industrial scale. Stalin would 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 literally kill millions of people, millions of his own people. Uh, uh, he would send out quota lists to regional authorities to kill x amount, x thousand of people per month. I mean, he was a it was an industrialized process of, of, of mass murder. Um, now, uh, the atrocities that have taken place in Ukraine aside, I mean, I don't see that sort of mass scale going on in Russia itself. I mean, what we see in Russia and what we've always seen. Is the is the is the sort of message job to use a mafia metaphor? You know that what Russia does is they identify key people and they specifically punish them or kill them to send a message to all the others in their group. So um, what they did very or maybe not even kill them, just ostracize them. So with the media, you saw this in the beginning of the Putin reign. What he would do would they would come in to take over media and they would take out some key uh, very prominent journalists or presenters and figures uh, or producers. And remove them and get them and, and basically say this person is persona non grata, these people are blacklisted, and they're out, you know, their career is over basically. Now there's a number of those journalists who were very prominent in the in the perestroika era, the 1990s, early 2000s, who are now in Ukraine. I've spoken about it with some of them, uh, and they said this is how it this is how it, it was done. You know, they didn't come in and, and, and fire the entire team, they didn't come in and, and, and kill people or jail everybody, say. But they took out a few key people and everyone else saw this and understood, OK, either I tow the line or I'm out too. Now, it's become more severe as the regime has gone on. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Like there was the, the, these, 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 um, um, these senior figures falling out of windows and whatnot. Um, I mean, I think this is also, well, actually, to, start, to take a step back, I think the same can be true also of... Um, Litvinenko in London in 2006, I and mean, that was a very clear message job. Uh, I think you know they used a very specific um, polonium poison to kill him because they wanted people to know it was Russia. Now, of course, Russia officially denies it, but actually, in reality, they wanted to make sure that everybody got the message. Because up until that point, there'd been a sense like, okay, in Russia, we stay quiet because we, we've got to be careful. But once we're outside Russia, it's kind of open season. We can say what we want. We can go there and we can sort of become opposition figures in Russia. So what they did is they obviously identified Litvinenko in London because London was one of the centres of this opposition talk, of this this vocal opposition to Russia, criticism of, of Putin. They said, well, they think London's safe. He thinks he's safe there. So they went into London. They got one of the most prominent figures and they poisoned him in a way that everyone would know that it was done by the Russians. There was no doubt that it wasn't a car accident or a heart attack or a burglary gone wrong or anything like that, which they could easily have done, much more easily. But they went to the elaborate stage of, of staging this massive this assassination so that the whole world and all these Russian immigrants and all this Russian exile community knew, if I continue to step out of line and criticise Putin, they will have me killed. And it, that message went through the community like wildfire, everyone understood and they all got the message. And if you look around, it did work. People are now aware that they can be killed anywhere. 
Uh, and then now we're seeing people falling out of windows. I think it's a similar sort of thing. I think that you know, the guy who fell out of the Indian hotel window last weekend, he'd, say, he'd made some, some critical comments online about the war. Um, not outrageous, actually. He'd not, got, he'd not come out and been a very outspoken. He'd made some comments that were, that were, that were certainly questionable. Uh, and then he backtracked and said, oh, no, of course I support the war. But it was enough, I think, for them to say, you know what? Here's another message we want to send. You know, don't think about it if you do it. And I think there's, a, there's been a lot of that. So they're not yet at the stage where they're massacring everyone. And I think that's not their modus operandi. What they like to do, what Putin likes to do, he likes to take people who are representative of certain things that he doesn't like, and he likes to publicly, essentially publicly execute them in ways that everyone, you know, everyone in Russia understands that someone falls out a window, that they have been executed, they have been assassinated. Everyone understands that without it having to, needing to be said. Uh, and the same with the poisoning. So I think it, it, it's, it's mafia-style message jobs. And it underlines, doesn't it, as well, and this is a theme, you know, coming back to the uh, the feudalism. Um, Ukraine had genuine oligarchs where their wealth actually translated into power, you know, whether it was media holdings or control over, um, you know, various verticals of industry. It was genuine power that they had accrued and could wield. These assassinations and the last sort of uh, nine, ten months have shown that there is no such thing as independent wealth in Russia. You know, if you're an oligarch or an official or a chinovnik or somebody who's accrued a large amount of wealth, in effect, you are renting that from the state. The state has granted you those funds in lieu of your continued support. Uh, you know, and, and and an agreement that you won't go and and engage in any kind of political opposition activity. Um, in effect, uh, you know, you're an agent of the state uh, if you are any kind of wealthy individual. And all these assassinations um, underlie the fact, doesn't it, that that there is no such thing as an independent, powerful oligarch. It, it just doesn't really exist in Russia. Yeah, I think they said, again, it speaks volumes about the nature of the regime, about the vertical of the, of the power vertical in Russia. They, they, they can't allow it to exist uh, because it would be a threat to the centre. It would very quickly become a threat to the centre and it would attract uh, other people to it and become a, a, a rival source of power. Um, I mean, I think Ukraine, yeah, Ukraine has always been a much more diverse country regionally. It's been a much more broken down country in terms of this power structures. It's much more horizontal. Uh, and when various different rulers over the last 30 years have tried to consolidate power, uh, they've come unstuck. Uh, that's been always a big problem. Um, it's uh, The oligarchs are, 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 have been very influential in, and many of them are are regionally based or regionally associated and they're connected to power power blocks there. Also politically the same is true that there's always been that sort of, there's always been that diversity, even in the 1990s, when Ukraine was much closer to the Russian model there with a much more authoritarian system. But even then there was a diversity that Russia think never has never had. Um, I think in Russia, it's not acceptable to have this, you know, independent power bases. And you see again, you know, that was one of the things that, that, that um, Putin crushed. Uh, and we've seen again over the last 10 months, a number of, 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 of very wealthy Russians have been, have had their businesses taken away from them or, or have, have suffered falls from windows, etc. You know, there is nobody who's above that. And, and they toe the line. You know, you see that. They, again, at the beginning of the war, there were a couple of incidents where some prominent figures made sort of vague sort of peace-like statements um, and, and, and I assume that they were sort of testing the water or perhaps they just wanted to somehow um, the, uh, prevent the, the, the full weight of Western sanctions falling on them, perhaps, or suggest that they might be somehow um, you know, worth, worth cultivating by the West you know, to avoid the full blow of sanctions. But they quickly, they quickly pulled back from that. They very quickly, I'm sure they were, they were told that they had to do so and warned of the consequences they did. So, yeah, I mean, I think Russia's system is becoming more and more rigidly vertical. And it's extraordinary, isn't it? As history unfolds, um, events that happened at the time don't necessarily have that full significance. You know, when we look at, say, the Orange Revolution and we look at even the Revolution of Dignity, they can be seen at the time as relatively local events. But through the course of history, we start to see that actually their impact on changing the world is far, far greater. And 
this seems to be the story of Ukraine, doesn't it, in the last sort of 30 years? Well, in fact, if you go back further, Ukraine has been at the centre of European history on many occasions and then slipped into the background, almost sort of its role forgotten, its economic, political and geographical role forgotten. It seems now to be at the ascendancy again, doesn't it, uh, in terms of a pivotal player in European history and politics? Um and in terms of a nation, you know, culturally, economically, it's becoming a tech and cultural powerhouse. Um, and that puts an additional value or meaning on these convulsions that Ukraine has gone through over the last 30 years, the numerous revolutions and so on that only have a sort of peripheral awareness in the West. Um, I'd love to hear your sort of thoughts on on how important these events in Ukraine are now becoming to sort of world affairs and European affairs, and especially the revolutions. Well, I think the Orange Revolution in particular is is a good one. I think you're quite right. Um, I mean, it, it was it was it, it was um, widely dismissed uh, soon after the revolution. I mean, the revolution itself was a was a was a was a huge event, and it was a massive media event. Um, it got a lot of, you know, put Ukraine on the map globally to a degree. But very soon afterwards, um, the, the consensus was that it, it failed and that it had politically been unsuccessful and it hadn't been that consequential. Consequential because, you know, years after the Orange Revolution, the the, 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 the pro-Russian forces were able to regain power. The the Orange, you know, the Orange pro-European forces basically failed in their mission to transform Ukraine. And so the whole thing was kind of written off as, as a you know nice try but a failure um, but I think that's very short-sighted because it wasn't really about the immediate political impact of it it was the geopolitical impact and also the nation building impact on Ukraine um, the orange revolution was a was a was a watershed moment for, for post-soviet Ukraine specifically it was a moment where you know, before the orange revolution Ukraine was very very close to Russia in terms of political system it was a very much more vertically uh, integrated authoritarian regime um they were moving more towards russia as, as putin was consolidating his power uh he was looking to create you know he was looking for ukraine to become a kind of belarus mark ii to become a much more authoritarian regime to be much closer to russia and that was what the orange revolution was all about people understood that they were on the cusp of this sort of return to a russian dominated uh, informal empire um, and that was a huge motivation for people at the time to come out on the streets and before that there's really been very little uh, popular engagement with politics it was the first time where you saw this and I, I was here at the time and I remember being uh, coming down to Kiev on the first day of the, of, the, of the protest of the revolution and being absolutely flabbergasted by the sheer scale of the of the of the, of the numbers the hundreds of thousands of people I'd never seen anything like it and frankly speaking I didn't Think it was it was possible. And my impression before that was that most Ukrainians were were basically indifferent, were very fatalistic about politics, would not engage in this way. But there they were, and and the mood was incredible. It was it was um, it was a really a really uh, formative experience for me personally. I think it changed my perceptions of Ukraine. It changed a lot of Ukrainians' perceptions about their own country. So for Ukraine, it was extremely important. And it, what it did for Ukraine, it didn't cure all the ills overnight, but what it did was it opened up the society. It made people feel that they were empowered, that they were invested in the country, that they could actually change something. And that changed everything. You know, after that, it was a real, you know, you could, it was a real before and after time for the Ukraine. You know, since the Orange Revolution, basically, the media became free of government control. Now, the Ukrainian media was still under oligarch control and was very corrupt in many ways. It wasn't an ideal media. So I think it's very important to underline we're not talking about a brilliant you know, top class journalism across the board. But what we are talking about is no more centrally controlled censored news, which was the case before the Orange Revolution, as Russia has still today and even more so today than before. Ukraine was moving in that direction. They had almost the same system of government censorship. And then basically after the Orange Revolution, Russia went, continued going in that direction. Ukraine went in the opposite direction and became a much freer environment in terms of media, in terms of information, in terms of politics, in terms of elections uh, across the board. So it's been very messy for Ukraine. It's been a very messy process, but it really did transform the country in very fundamental ways uh, and change the entire mood of the country in the way they relate to their own identity. It was the first time that Ukrainians, I think, really felt like They'd done something and Ukraine had something that it could be proud of and that it could identify with. So huge for Ukraine, but also internationally. If you look at Putin's Russia, 2004, the Orange Revolution was a real watershed and it really was the time where they turned against the West. Within months of the Orange Revolution, uh, 
Putin launched Russia Today TV channel, which was a huge, you know, massive moment in, 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 in the progress of the authoritarian regime there. Within months of it, the fir- for the first time, they launched the whole um, St. George's Ribbons and Victory Day cult, which hadn't been a thing before. People now think oh, they've always had that. They didn't always have it. They basically, of course, Victory Day was always a major event. But the whole cult of it, and certainly the wearing of ribbons and the promotion of this symbolism, was actually 2005 was the first year they did that, uh, and that was again a response to the orange ribbons that people were wearing on my dad during the Orange Revolution. Uh, after 2004, Russian rhetoric changed dramatically. They became very hostile to the West. NGOs and civil society in Russia were basically shut down and crushed. West, the West was openly discussed as, a, as an enemy, you know, the adversarial relationship. Before that, Putin often talked about you know, cooperation, the, the Russia, Russian support for the invasion of Afghanistan and things like this. So um, it, was a, it was a watershed moment for the entire region. Uh, and I think people didn't really appreciate that at the time. I think now they're starting to appreciate it more. They're starting to appreciate Ukraine's role. But it's not, you know, this is historically quite common. World War II. Uh, as as um, historians now are starting to recognise more and more, Timothy Snyder is one who's, who's been at the forefront of this, was essentially fought primarily, the primary, at least the primary goal for Hitler, World War II, was Ukraine. It's the conquest of Ukraine. Um, and he fought, you know, and he prioritised that in his invasion of the Soviet Union. He famously overruled his generals who wanted to march on Moscow and said, no, we've got to take Ukraine. And he famously said, you know, my generals understand nothing of the economics of modern warfare. We must have Ukraine. That, that was his goal. And if you read his, his writings, um, the, the, the obviously Mein Kampf and his speeches and then the, the, the table talk book, which which is available of Hitler's comments around the time of the war, uh, amongst his in his private circle, he talks openly about Ukraine as the idea, you know, as the idea of, of Lebensraum. That's what he wanted. That's where he wanted to build his empire. He had this, you know, this 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 uh, sick vision of a future Ukraine of Ukrainian slaves basically serving their German masters, and that would be the basis of German Germany's world power. So. Ukraine has always been this important country that somehow gets overlooked, somehow doesn't, doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, I think we're through another cycle of that now. Again, you can look at the collapse of the Soviet Union. Again, Ukraine played a key role in that. But I think if we're looking at Putinism, Ukraine has been central, and the loss of Ukraine, and the fear of the loss of Ukraine has been absolutely central to driving Putin's uh, rampant, sort of increasingly rampant nationalism and authoritarianism within Russia itself, and his animosity to the West. Uh, and this fear that the West is somehow uh, supporting Ukraine uh, and standing with Ukraine as it looks to to move away from Russia. And I think this is another aspect, isn't it? And this is very little known in the West, but I think would be quite well known by Putin. And that is that Ukraine, even within the Soviet uh, economic system, Ukraine had a pivotal role, didn't it? Um, with its, uh, you know, capabilities in engineering, aerospace, missile production, ship production, um, Ukraine actually produced a lot of the brains uh, behind the Soviet military industrial complex. Um, and of course, culturally speaking, Russia has been very expert at appropriating uh, aspects of Ukrainian culture, um, whether that be Ilya Repin, you know, whether the famous painter uh, or mm. Google or others. Russia is is great at sort of claiming uh, these these cultural sort of landmarks, as it were. But actually, Ukraine turns out to be a real dynamo technologically and culturally which I think is going to, you know, the awareness of that is going to build um, in the wake of its victory in this war. Absolutely. No, I mean, this is the, the as you mentioned, you know, one of Russia's great, you know, one of Russia's great successes is its ability, has, it has been its ability to pass off uh, Ukrainians and Ukrainian achievements as Russian. Um, this is something now that we're seeing quite actively. You know, it's quite common now to, 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 to read stories of Ukrainians who've approached, you know, a museum or a gallery somewhere, and said, you know, this 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 picture you have here of a Russian dancer, or this picture of a of a Russian, you know, a Russian whatever lord or something. This is actually Ukrainian, or this is this was this the artist is Ukrainian, the subject may be Ukrainian, and in some in some cases they're having that corrected. In some cases, not, but it's a theme that's becoming much more much more prominent as Ukrainians are sort of trying to reclaim their heritage, reclaim their their their, their own ancestry, and in, for, for Ukrainians, a lot a lot of Ukrainians didn't know a lot of this stuff. You know, they're also rediscovering it. 
Yeah, you mentioned Repin and, and Gogol. That's two classic examples. There's a lot of them, you know, like the Cossack dances, which are widely seen as, you know, this, the dancing with the, with the legs going out, you know, and it's not widely seen as, oh, it's the Russian dance. No, it's not. It's the Ukrainian dance. It was famously Ukrainian, but that was not known because Ukraine was not known. So Ukraine is sort of reclaiming their heritage and trying to do that on an international scale as well and say to the world, you know, like, you think Ukraine is this unknown country. Actually, it's a very well-known country, but you just didn't know it was Ukrainian. You know the things from Ukraine. You know, um, personally, I think that you know, I, I like the. I, I think that Ukraine should also, and, and it is, but should perhaps do more in terms of um, publicizing the ideas of how Ukraine has been not just the subject and victim of Russian imperialism, but also a site of you know, historical disinformation. You know, the, the Pachomkin villages. Where in Ukraine. I mean, the famous Potomkin villages may or may not have existed, depending on who you read, but the, the, the story of the Potomkin villages was the story of Russian colonization of Ukraine. They, these villages were elect, erected on the banks of the Dnipro River as Catherine the Great sailed down the river to observe her new territories, her new conquest. So it was literally the Potomkin village was the Russian Empire in Ukraine. Uh, which is, I think, a beautiful metaphor for what we've seen since then in terms of disinformation and the way that Russia has used disinformation, weaponized it for, it for its current imperial war in Ukraine. Uh, and then, then again, of course, the whole of the war, which is also perhaps, you know, the ultimate sort of disinformation, where they literally were able to cover up a, a genocide, a mass murder of millions and millions of people, uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the Western media playing the role of a complex, you know, with, with the New York Times bureau chief in Moscow sitting there in, in the Soviet capital and basically... Uh, censoring and silencing and, and, and his colleagues and promoting this disinformation. So Ukraine has always been this uh, victim or, or subject, object perhaps of disinformation over, over centuries and centuries. And uh, unfortunately, we have to say it was very effective, this disinformation. Again, as I was saying earlier, you know, Russia gets a lot wrong, but they're very good at propaganda and disinformation. And you can see that more than anywhere, I think, in terms of Ukraine. And, and, and it, it, the evidence is how little the world actually knows about Ukraine, and which is remarkable, really, when you consider how big it is and how important it's been historically as a territory. And, and, and there's an extraordinary echo as well, isn't there, in terms of the Western journalist or the Welsh journalist, uh, Gareth Jones, who actually reported truthfully on the Holodomor, uh, Bolshevik agents then tracked him down and assassinated him. So we've got echoes yeah. of those sort of terroristic practices that are happening now to control the information sphere. And um, that was going on uh, back then in, in the 1930s as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The story of Gareth Jones is, is you know, I was very, I was very pleased to see a film made about him and, and all to see, a, you know, the film framed around his experience. I think he's a figure who, who deserves to be, much greater recognition as 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 a, as a hero, as a general a heroic figure. Um, what he did was amazing. But again, you know, he did all that. And it, the, the thing is, you know, when you're dealing with Russian disinformation and Ukraine, is there's a sense, or there was a sense, I think certainly in 2014, of like, okay, we need to get the truth out there. And then after a period, you realise it's not enough to get the truth out there. You know, Gareth Jones got the truth out there, and he was shouted down and suppressed by Durante and others. And, and, and people didn't know, and it was forgotten. And the Soviet Union was recognised by the United States, and everyone sort of just brushed it to one side. Um, we've seen a lot of that since 2014. I think, again, again, especially the first, first months of the war, there were huge efforts in Ukraine to sort of debunk all these Russian myths. And there were endless articles of why this is a lie and why that's a lie and what the reality is. And, and uh, I was involved in a lot of those efforts at the time. Right? And, and it was frustrating in the sense that you put the truth out there and you kind of hope, well, that's it then, it's done, we've kind of debunked it. But it just continues. And it, and, and, and you, the, the first, there was a sort of sense of disbelief, like, but hold on, we just, you know, debunked that. We just yeah, we've done that not, bit, yes. We've done that, How can, but, it, but it just keeps going. And, you know, you'll get, you know, it, a lot of it in terms, is, is in terms of engagement, emotional engagement. You know, you tell people things that they like to hear or they find interesting or they get all that support their preconceived notions or whatever it might be. And then if someone comes on and says, well, actually, that's not true. They're like, OK, whatever. Then tell me more about this thing that, that I like or that I engage with or that's just, that fits my, my own um, prejudices, as it were. Um, so it, 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 the fighting against disinformation is incredibly difficult. And a lot of it, I think, is or perhaps the most effective things are things like the, the you know, film, Hollywood, and you know, basically the emotional engagement um, products that entertain rather than inform, and the information comes via that. This is something the Russians themselves understand. I mean, they do that very well, again. And they, they also, even on, on, on the level where I was in, on, in Russia, they have got to the stage where they actually sort of um, plant their, their, their news information propaganda 
within sort of uh, soft content, within cultural content, you know, between a, you know, the latest soap opera or a pop show or wherever it may be, and they'll put it in like a commercial break just in there because they understand that people aren't going to, are, are already growing tired of it, they've lost their appetite for this, they are rejecting it. So they're sort of finding different ways to seed it in there, uh, sort of slip it in to, to, to influence audiences. I mean, this is the exhausting aspect, and I think as a as a sort of a, a journalist and publisher, I can see how you'd find that immensely frustrating. But the effectiveness of Russian propaganda is that it is just relentless, isn't it? You know, they they will lose one particular battle, or but it just it's it's just an endless stream of lies, and the narrative may shift or change, the format may shift or change. They may find other voices to parrot it as are happening in uh, right-wing American media. But the same lie just seems coming at you again and again and again, despite, you know, the more sophisticated efforts to to counter it. Um, Ukraine seems to be quite a bit more resilient to those lies now, perhaps, than, than other regions of the world, however. I, I get the impression they have far less traction in Ukraine uh, in 2022, though. Yes, I mean, I think they've they've now sort of they've now lost their their, their mo- most of their traction in Ukraine, but it's it's been a terrible process. It's been you know they paid Ukraine's paid a terrible price for that. I mean, Russian Russian um, propaganda used to have a much greater influence on Ukraine and um, have a much wider impact on Ukraine on Ukraine's uh, political dialogue. Um, but it also, it, 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 as you mentioned, it's very clever at evolving. Um, uh, until 2014, the Russian propaganda in Ukraine was quite similar to the Russian propaganda in Russia itself. It was still quite anti-Ukrainian or anti-Ukrainian national identity. It still questioned whether Ukraine was a country, whether Ukraine had the right to, to, to independence, whether Ukraine had the ability to, to the competence to manage its affairs um, and things like that. It sort of on, looked to undermine Ukraine identity. I think after 2014, when the with the seizure of Crimea, the invasion of East Ukraine, the beginning of hostilities, um, Russian narratives became less effective in Ukraine because of U- Ukraine's national consolidation. So uh, they then switched, changed tacks then, and then the narrative was very much, well, Ukraine is no longer independent because Ukraine's been taken over by uh, the West. Ukraine is basically a puppet regime. Ukraine is being managed from outside. Ukraine is a colony, etc. And then a lot of the focus was on the West and the degree to which the West was now dictating terms to Ukraine, the West was looking to exploit Ukraine, that Ukrainians were being uh, used in a proxy sense, um, and that was that, and that was more effective because Ukrainians were, were, you know, there was there were there was a, a significant number of Ukrainians who were prepared to, to sort of buy into that narrative, whereas they would have rejected a, a more openly mm-hmm. Russian narrative. Um, but I think now, yeah, there's a, the resilience even to that has grown now because because of the extremity of the situation, because they see that there's, there's a, the, you know, the, most Ukrainians consider this war to be genocide. They consider their nation to be, their national existence to be under threat. Um, they're aware that uh, what's happening in the occupied regions, you know, every region that's liberated, they see the same horror stories. They, they talk to each other. They know, you know, everybody knows people who are living in the occupied regions or have come from there who have first-hand experience of, of, of the horrors that are taking place. Uh, and so they, they really, you know, they are now much less tolerant of these sort of stories. But you still see them. I still see them amongst friends. Things still slip through. Narratives slip through, and you hear something, you say, "Are you sure?" And then they're like, "Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't." You know, I didn't yeah. There's very, it's, it's, it's relentless, as you, as you mentioned. It's a really relentless process. Um, and now it's, I think, really all about just undermining people's faith in the Ukrainian authorities undermining their their will to fight on um and, and just sort of chipping away as best they can but i think the ukrainians are certainly much more resilient than, than many societies and certainly than ukraine was going back say 10 years um the situation has changed absolutely radically you know absolutely fundamentally uh for the better but it was very i mean in it, 10 years ago half of the tv shows on ukrainian tv were russian uh, and they weren't the news shows, of course. It wasn't like Putin mm. on TV, but it was all the, 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 you know, the cop shows, the drama shows, the history shows, all of which are saturated in Russian propaganda. I mean, all of them are funded, financed, directed, and, and coordinated with the Kremlin. You know, they they are literally dripping in in Russian Soviet uh, imperial uh, messaging, and they the Russian TV was, was absolutely was absolutely full of this content. 
Uh, and at the time, that was not seen as a, you know, a, a national security issue. I think now people look back on that in the sense of sort of horror and amazement. Uh, but that shows how far things have come. You know, that in those days, that was that was considered the norm. And this, this is coming back to the argument of Ukraine as a proxy. Um, you know, when Russia couldn't control it in the way that it's controlled Belarus, um, it goes from being, uh, you know, something that is that is, um, you know, a bit broken, but you know, ultimately you you can control it to the point where Ukraine clearly couldn't, so it was no longer within Russia's orbit. Then it becomes a proxy for the West. Now that argument unfortunately has a lot of traction still uh, on the left and the right and that's an argument that i'm sure you know you as as many of us have had day in day out uh, bombarded um by that argument both from thinking as well as i would say malicious uh, opponents um that also however denies ukraine its own agency and it, in some ways it's entirely pernicious i mean how do we counter that? Because you can see that argument coming even within the Western alliance from, uh, you know, some of Macron's more, I'm going to say it, more idiotic and unthinking statements um, to many voices in Germany and especially, you know, on the fringes of, of Europe in, in, in Italy, Hungary, Serbia, places where actually these, these voices get a lot more traction. This proxy argument is one that really has to be fought, doesn't it? And Zelensky's trip to Washington, I think, was especially pivotal in the struggle against that whole sort of proxy propagandist line. I think there's a, I think there's a tendency to sort of assume, to, to, to paint this this war and, 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 uh, and Ukraine's struggle, you know, to have Ukraine as a sort of footnote in its own history. And this is, this is partly a product of, of of our, our lack of awareness of Ukraine historically, traditionally, you know, the fact that Ukraine has not been, uh, isn't people, people aren't familiar with Ukraine, they're not familiar with the fact that this has been an ongoing process for decades, arguably for centuries, and you can go back, to, you know, three, three, four hundred years and, and find a, a, a fairly clear sort of, if not straight line, uh, certainly a long term, very, very long term uh, process of Ukraine's statehood ambitions and, 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 and struggle for statehood it is not known. So there is this sense that it's come out of nowhere. It's like all of a sudden Ukraine is, is at odds with Russia. So you know, someone is provoking them, someone is, is feeding this, someone is, is forcing this, and somehow that it's artificial, that it's been manufactured. Uh, and, that, and that somehow the West is to blame. I mean, the West always assume, I think most, a lot of people in the West, certainly since 1991, when the West has been so uh, triumphant and so dominant in, in global affairs, there is a sense to assume that anything that happens, the West is, is, is to blame or is, is orchestrating it somehow because the West is, is the dominant power and the West does everything and everyone else is just reacting to the West. So um, again, you know, Ukraine is, is, is a victim of these, these prejudices that are much bigger than Ukraine. And because we know so little about Ukraine internationally, generally speaking, that it's very easy to sort of project these things onto Ukraine. Uh, I think it's all about, you know, for my, I think the way to counter it is really to, to raise awareness of Ukraine, to put Ukraine at the centre of the, the argument, to say, like, this is not a war between Russia and NATO. This is not NATO expansion to the east. This is not the West. This is not even the, you know, the European Union. Um, it, what it is, is Russia is reacting to the, the stimulus that's, you know, the threat to them and the threat, which is actually the story, is Ukraine's nation building process. Ukraine is consolidating its statehood. Ukraine is, is consolidating itself around an identity of European democracy. It sees itself as a European democracy very clearly. That's become a stronger and stronger identity. Again, going back to the 1991 and certainly the Orange Revolution. And that is the, that is the story. That's why Putin is doing what he's doing. He wouldn't be doing this if Ukraine was where it was in the early 1990s, he'd be quite comfortable with that. I mean, say we don't need to do anything. Ukraine's with us. Ukraine is, is we, you know, we still effectively own Ukraine. Ukraine poses no threat to us. It cannot serve as a catalyst for change in Russia or the further breakup of the Russian Empire or any of these things. We're quite comfortable. So we don't need to physically go in and invade Ukraine. Um, the whole thing is being driven not by again, not by the West, not by Russia. It's being driven by Ukraine. You know, so it's about agency. You know, you mentioned the the denial of agency. That's very very much the case by both sides, by both Russia and the West, when they they push this narrative of proxy. But I think the only answer to that is to say, well, look, 
this whole process is Ukraine. And it even it's even you could even go further than that and say it's the Ukrainian people. It's not even the Ukrainian leadership. The Ukrainian leadership are lit, are being led to a high degree by the Ukrainian people. Uh, Ukrainian presidents very often come to power with a certain agenda and then find that they are being directed in different ways by the by the population, by the by the desire of the people. You know, and now we have perhaps the ultimate expression of that. We have a people's war, a popular war. We have the country mobilized in ways that very few countries I think can really can really appreciate now that they could even imagine. You know, you have hundreds of thousands of people in arms, in uniforms, fighting, but you also have millions of people who are saving money up to collecting money financing the army who are taking care of uh, refugees who are taking care of offering psychological support to victims of russian uh, war crimes who are forming drone armies who are you know forming weapons weapons uh, in, in, in weapons manufacturing the, the activity across the country in support of the war is absolutely phenomenal uh, and this is this is the real answer to the proxy idea. It's like yes, the West is helping, but the idea that this could somehow be that Ukrainians are being manipulated is is, is nonsense. And we need to 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 get beyond that. We need just to see more of what the Ukrainians themselves are doing, how they're how they're leading this this narrative. And the picture in Russia is quite the opposite, isn't it? I mean, Putin, far from being a master strategist, is pursuing a war at all costs. That is destroying the entire basis of his economic system uh and he seems to not quite understand that which is extraordinary um you know destroying the oil industry exports tech aviation uh automotive industries all of these are on their knees in russia with very little prospect of them actually rebounding even uh after ukraine is victorious uh in the war um he seems to be engaged in a monumental grudge match rather than a strategy. So, I mean, my, 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 my final sort of question really is going to be about what does 2023 hold as Ukraine is in the ascendancy? As you say, it's organizing economically, technologically. It's going through an extraordinary tech boom, which will you know help the economy rebound after victory. Russia seems to be the the opposite trajectory, uh, economically, organizationally, even demographically. Um, all the indicators are pretty catastrophic, aren't they, for Russia's future? Yes, I think well I think that the you know the, the scale of the damage being done to Russia can't can't be un, can't be overestimated. I mean it's huge. And I think that speaks volumes for how important this is for Putin, how young he sees this as a a life and death struggle for, for, for Russia as he sees Russia. Um, I think you know Putin is a, uh, is, a, is, a is a product of the Soviet collapse. Is, is perhaps the ultimate product of the Soviet collapse. You know he was he was he was there on the front lines, as it were, in, in East Germany when the Berlin Wall came down. He saw that. He watched as Russia's sort of empire unravelled. He came back to Russia. This sort of and watched the Soviet collapse and sort of passively had to observe this 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 deep deep humiliation and this sense of humiliation and this sense of collapse has never really left him you know i think and, and ukraine is a manifestation of that the war in ukraine is a manifestation of that it's uh it, it encompasses it all you know the soviet collapse from the biggest injustice of the soviet collapse is ukraine is the existence of an independent ukraine putin openly says it shouldn't exist it's russian historical land this land was given to ukraine by the bolsheviks he's very often spoken about that very very emotionally that this is this was a crime, this is wrong. And, and Ukraine can only exist together with Russia, that they're one people, that there are no Ukrainians, Ukrainians are actually Russians, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So for him, you know, the, the Ukraine's existence is is a is the key symbol of the Soviet collapse, the injustice of the Soviet collapse. And he's also very fearful of further collapse. Uh, so he he feels that if Ukraine is allowed to consolidate and, and genuinely um cement its independence and pursue its its euro-atlantic agenda it will lead to it will become a catalyst for further collapse so you know economic losses uh, demographic losses loss of prestige loss of, of of partnerships elsewhere all of those things are secondary for putin because he understands that if he does not stop ukraine's uh, trajectory away from russia now then russia itself will probably unravel and will uh, will collapse and certainly his regime will collapse and quite possibly the Russian Federation with it. 
Um, so this is this, these are the stakes for Putin himself, and I think this explains why he's prepared to go to such lengths. Um, so that obviously will will have major consequences for uh, you know what we can major implications rather for what we can expect in 2023. You know he's not going to just back off. I don't think he's not going to say okay, time for time to to retreat and sort of lick my wounds and and, uh, and, and accept that it didn't work out and sort of try and find some compromise. I don't see that happening at all. Um, I don't see the Russian position on the domestic front being catastrophically bad yet. I think that the thing is with Russia, there's always this sense that things are much more fragile than they appear. And so, you know, the collapse could come and it could come very quickly. You know, you never know. And every time you see, you know, the latest thing now in recent days has been the run on the banks and there's big queues at banks and people are getting their money and people are very angry about that. Maybe, let's see. Um, frankly, I don't have a huge amount of faith in the Russian domestic scene collapsing, and I certainly don't expect to see any major protests in Russia. I don't think the Russian people have any have any interest in that. I don't think it's part of their their social makeup these days. Uh, after twenty odd years of Putinism um, and the way that they very skillfully again message the, the the horrors of the 1990s. Now, so everyone's so afraid of of another 1990s style change and collapse. What I do think we might see. Uh, or at least, let's say, it's far more likely would be a a collapse in the military in Ukraine, the Russian military that's in Ukraine. I think that the the the, the potential there is far greater, uh, especially as they're sort of diluting their forces with more and more mobilized conscripts who really don't want to be there, uh, have very low levels of training and have very low levels of motivation, um, and are not enjoying the, their their experience at all. It would seem. I think there's a far greater chance that that fighting force may simply just effectively cease to function, cease to exist, certainly at least in part. Uh, and they may well have, you know, that will lead to, to very grave military consequences, of course. So we may see um, significant further Ukrainian gains in, in the months ahead. Uh, will it be enough to win the war decisively? Well, I, we'll have to see. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be over soon, unfortunately, I fear. Um, and even if Ukraine were able to let's say, liberate mainland Ukraine and to force Russia back to the borders of 1991. Then the question, of course, would be Crimea. Does Ukraine go into Crimea? Does Ukraine isolate Crimea? How can maybe could, could Crimea become a bargaining chip of some sort? Uh, could it be sort of put on a back shelf, diplomatically speaking, and left as an open question for a period? Um, they're all questions that we'd see if Ukraine is successful militarily in the coming months. But even if we get to that stage, I think, there's not going to be, you know, unless we have a, a, a sort of grand reckoning, the grand deal of sorts, it's not over. You know, Russia's still there. Russia still has imperial, uh, an imperial agenda. Um, Putin may be there, he may not be there, but there's very little chance of being a liberal Russia taking over and saying, you know what, you know, we, what a terrible mistake we made. And, we, you know, we, we, we abandon all these imperial ideas. That's not going to happen. So we're going to have a long term period of, of confrontation between Russia and Ukraine and between Russia and the West, I think. Um, that's not going to go away. And I think the, the crucial thing for Ukraine will be to get some sort of cast iron security guarantees uh, and to continue to receive the kind of military support they've received, perhaps even more so, perhaps even, even at an accelerated level. Because Ukrainians now are sort of aware that they're going to be, they're basically going to be living in a very militarized society for the foreseeable future. That's not going to change. It's a sort of Israel type scenario on, on a very grand scale in a country of 40 million plus. They're going to have to live with that because they're going to have to live with Russia. So um, I'm uh, I was cautiously optimistic about the military prospects for the coming months. I think mean, Ukraine's performed very well in 2022. You know, it's, it's performed better than all expectations, even amongst those who've had high expectations. I count myself amongst them. Even so, they've outperformed. Uh, they've done exceptionally well. The Ukrainian nation has risen to the challenge. I think this has been a, a very formative period in Ukraine's nation building process, and they've come through it despite the, the trauma that they've experienced. I think fundamentally they've come through it much stronger as a nation. So I'm I'm, I'm quietly optimistic, if it's sort of cautiously optimistic, but um, it's not clear for me how decisive they will be able to be in terms of military success. And it's certainly not clear long term how they're going to be able to find some sort of equilibrium in their relations with Russia, because I don't see the problems that we have with Russia in terms of its imperial identity uh, and aggressive, aggressive nature going away uh, in, in the, in the foreseeable future.
Absolutely. Given Russia's actions, for it to be normalized, for it to be reintegrated within the world uh, economy, Russia would have to admit its culpability, it would have to pay reparations, it would have to sign binding peace deals, relinquish all the territory it's gained. There are so many hoops it would need to jump through and potentially send some of its key propagandists and elite to The Hague. We can't see any of these things happening. Therefore, Russia is going to remain a pariah, a malevolent uh, state on the periphery, isn't it, for the conceivable future? Frankly speaking, yes. It's hard to imagine a different scenario. I think you're quite right that it's very, it's very difficult to, to even imagine any of those things happening, any of the things that need to happen actually happening. And I think that um, until they do happen, we, we will see Russia isolated, certainly from the West. And, and, and this is already, you know, this is a process that I think a lot of European countries are now very reluctantly recognizing. I'm thinking mostly of Germany here. You know, I think they would, Germans have, have, have invested decades of, of, of their diplomatic um, capital in trying to build a productive and very profitable relationship with Russia and have, have basically positioned that as, as a, uh, a moderating influence on Russia. I and mean, they've all, Germans' position has always been yes, we want to make money with Russia, but we think that, that this is the way to keep Russia in line to sort of have Russia as a, as a, as a, as an adult uh, responsible member of the international community is to, is to, to make, to invest in Russia and make Russia invested in having a productive relationship. And that's completely, you know, that's all, that's all torn up now. That's all gone now. And I think Russian Germans are starting to, to accept and it's been, they've been very reluctant about it, but they have basically, you know, had to accept in the last 10 months that that's all off the table now. And that's been repeated across the board. We see that elsewhere. We see the same process in Italy. We see the same process in France, in other countries. And uh, I think less so in, in, in elsewhere in the world, in, in, in the Middle East, in, in, in India, in China, uh, they're more looking to take advantage of Russia's weakness. But I think what we're look, where, where Russia will be in the, in the coming years will be as a country that is essentially a, 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 resource, a resource and commodities provider for the emerging world, for India, China, uh, and the BRICS nations, other, other economies like that. Uh, and it will be cut off increasingly from Europe uh, economically and, and to, a, to, a, to a significant degree, I think also culturally, um, there'll be less interaction, there'll be less um, engagement with Russia. And it's hard to see that changing in the, in, in the, in the medium term. And of course, the margins on selling commodities, unprocessed commodities to the third world are far less than the gross margins of actually selling say gas to to germany uh, under under very lucrative contracts so it, the future is not not bright clearly for russia for ukraine however um this sense of of, of nationhood coming together it, it must be an extraordinarily exciting place to live i mean this is going to be my last question because i know i've been you've been very generous <laughs> with your time but it must be extraordinary living at the center of these events in a country that is so rapidly moving to become, um, you know, take its place once more in history after having been forgotten, left out of world history in, in so many different uh, occasions through the 19th and 20th centuries. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's Charles Dickens, you know, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Um, it is a deeply, deeply traumatic time. I mean, the horrors that we see on a daily basis are, 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 are very very distressing and you know there are times when it overwhelms you there's times when it just literally you know you, you feel you feel you feel numb you can't you can't even cope with it and this is when you're engaging from a distance i'm not you know, not talking about I, mean, I can't can't compare to the horrors of the people who are actually on the front dealing with these things uh, but at the same time yes it is incredible it's exhilarating it's inspirational um, to see what Ukraine is, is, is achieving now in, in terms of its national consolidation, in terms of its resilience, in terms of the spirit of the people, um, in terms of the humour of the people, in terms of the, the, wit, the quick wittedness and, and the, 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 um, the joy of life, the, 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 the positivity that still shines through, you know, all these characters, these factors uh, are also overwhelming, they're also incredible and it, you know, it just brings tears to your eyes sometimes. Um, and, then, and then in the bigger sense, the sense that this country has been on this journey for so long and they're actually now so close to achieving this. Um, I mean, it's not a destination. It's not the end. It will go on and on. I mean, I mean the nation, nation building is, is, is an open-ended process, but um, they're so close to now achieving this incredible uh, um, 
realization that they've worked for for so many for so long the centuries and certainly the decades i've been here for, for over 20 years and i've been watching this process and been observing this process very very uh, very closely for, for for that period and uh it is exhilarating it's incredible and uh once ukraine wins i believe ukraine will win this war um once they win then the future of this country will be extremely, extremely interesting. I believe it will be very bright. I think we'll see Ukraine emerge as a major European country. It will be a, it will be a, a major military country. It will be a major military power. It will be a major tech power. It will be a major agricultural power. Uh, and I think it will be a major cultural power. I think it will have huge cultural projection. And um, I think we'll also see people from all over the world coming to Ukraine. You know, the amount of investment that will come to Ukraine, the amount of people who just want to come here and see this amazing country that they've heard so much about and meet these amazing people. Uh, it's, it's as I say, it's a traumatic time. It's not a celebratory time. It's not a time for, you know, for, 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 for celebrations. But on the other hand, it is a very, very exciting time uh, and the future is bright. Well, Peter, I'm immensely grateful uh, that you've spent so much time uh, and the fact that it's ended on such a, a positive note, this conversation, uh, when so many conversations this year have have been, you know, say extremely negative and pessimistic when it wasn't wasn't absolutely clear earlier in the year that Ukraine was going to be victorious. I think now it is. Um, that won't come soon enough. Um, but I'm hugely grateful to you for speaking to me this morning. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Slava Ukraine. Good evening, Slava.